I thought, um, given the the, the uh, time of year that we're in, uh, and many of us will have seen the carols by candlelight and a lot of the uh, Christmas movies on the on the television at the moment, uh, that I guess with the commercialization of uh, of what Christmas has become, uh, and also what Christmas is put, is you know in the, in the eyes of many Christians is supposed to stand for. And that is, of course, the birth of Jesus, even though everyone admits that the 25th of December is not actually the time that he was born. I thought this would be an interesting time for us to look at uh, Isa, or Jesus as he is, through the eyes of um, Muslim historians. And uh, today I wanted to share to you, because I, I find it fascinating that even though he is the prophet that came before the prophet Muhammad wasallam. I, I know personally, I don't know too much about his story. Uh, I mean, we know that he, in, in, our, in our belief, that he wasn't crucified. But besides that, we don't know, oh, I, personally, I don't know much about his backstory and who he was as a person. And uh, so the, the, the story of the, the, um, his biography that I'm, I'm sharing with you today is, is from Ibn Kathir. It's a very reliable source. And um, I hope uh, you'll enjoy it, inshallah. So, the, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was sitting down one day and uh, some tribes from Najran, who were Christian tribes, came to him and they said, uh, they, they obviously believed in the Trinity, they believed that, uh, that God was the Father, the Son and the Holy Ghost, and uh, they, were, they were trying to tell this to the Prophet. But they also said that uh, not every Christian believes this, that there has become some difference of opinion amongst themselves, and even that is the case today with the uh, even uh, with the Jehovah Witnesses and, and some other churches. They don't all believe uh, that he was, uh, was was in the Trinity, and they asked the Prophet, peace be upon him, to to tell tell them uh, the story of of Isa. And at that point, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala revealed the um, the verses about his his birth. Now, uh, just before we go to that. Uh, it says in the Quran about him that in Allah has tafa Adam wa Nuh wa Ala Ibrahim wa Ala Imran ala al Alamin. That verily Allah has chosen Adam, uh, Noah, the family of Abraham, and the fa the family of Imran over uh, all of mankind. So most of us we all know who Adam is. We all know who Noah, Noah is, who Ibrahim is, but uh, not many of us know who the family of Imran is. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to read his uh, his um, uh, where he came from. So we because he's very connected with Isa. He's a man that's very connected with Jesus. So I thought it might be interesting to know what his uh, family history is. So he his name was Imran ibn Bashim, and he was the the son of Ibn Amun, Ibn Misha, Ibn Husqiya, Ibn Ahrik, Ibn Muthan, and his his uh, his uh, heritage goes straight to David, to Dawood. So Imran, the fa who, who was the, the head of the family of Imran, he was a relative of Dawood, of David. Now, Prophet Zakaria, Prophet Zakaria's wife, had a daughter, uh, sorry, his wife's sister, so Prophet Zakaria's wife's sister, so his, his sister-in-law, had a daughter, and her name was Hara, uh, sorry, Hannah. Her name was Hannah, and she was married to this Imran. So now you remember this Imran and his wife, who is Hannah. So and she is the sister-in-law of the Prophet Zakaria. Imran, she was so she was married to Imran. Imran was the leader of the Bani Israel of the Israelites. Many years had passed, and Imran and Hannah were, were not able to have a child. And they became, obviously, being a, a mother, she, oh sorry, being a, a woman, she, she would look many times, I hope, so, I hope we're not getting bombed here, <laughs> uh, I know it is Sydney, sorry, thanks down, but uh, let's, be, let's be careful, sorry, us Melbourne folks aren't used to that. Um, so, now, she had a, um, she obviously wanted to have a child, but years were passing and uh, they were not able to have a child. So one day she made a, she took an oath and she prayed to, to Allah. She, she said, Oh Allah, if you give me a child, 
I will devote that child to your service. And uh, what happened, of course, uh, sorry, not, not just to your service, but also to look after the, your temple, or the Beit Mokhlis, in, in Jerusalem. That child will be in the service of that temple. And uh, so it happens that uh, she fell pregnant and uh, with Imran, and um, she was off to have that baby. Now, while she was pregnant, Imran passed away. And of course, she was quite sad about that because that meant that uh, that he would never see his child. Now, what happened is, uh, and naturally, she gave birth to this child, and and that child was called Maryam. That was obviously we all know that Mary, Maryam, the, who would become the mother of Isa of Jesus. Now, she had a problem at this point because she assumed that she had that this child would be a boy. For one reason, back in those times, uh, women were not allowed inside the temple. Uh, and I guess you can sometimes look at some of today's mosques and you think might, there might be a bit of similarity given some of the situation. But um, those times, it was strictly forbidden, no entry at all. So she couldn't understand because she's had a daughter. How is this daughter going to be in service of the temple and praying to Allah in that temple if she's a female? And she herself could not take the daughter inside there. So she went to Zakaria, the Prophet Zakaria, and, and, and said, what, what am I going to do? But he said, it's okay. Allah knew your promise to him, and there is a reason that she is a girl. So what she did was she wrapped this the Maryam up in a, in a cloth, and she took him, she sorry, took her to the temple and said um, that, uh, you know, obviously the people in the temple should, should look after her. Now, of course, this, everyone knew that this, this was Imran's daughter, so, so quite, quite a, a special child. And they started fighting over who would, look, who would ha be the guardian of this child. And, of course, they were fighting, everyone saying, I want her, I want her, I want her. And Zak the Prophet Zakaria was saying, I should have right, I am her family, I, I can uh, look after her the, the best, I will have her concern. So what they did back in those days, uh, you, you always hear that they would draw lots, or they would draw sticks. Um, uh, not like today, where we, we, if we need to decide something, we do uh, paper, scissors, rock, or something like that. Uh, uh, back in those days, they would draw lots. In, in this case, what they did was they would get the, um, the reef, uh, in the, uh, in the, they would chuck it in the river, and the last one to sink would be uh, the person that would get whatever that, that issue was. So uh, they put it in the, the in the, the in the river, and of course Zakaria was the um the, his his one was the last one to sink. Sorry, a reed, not a reef, uh, a reed. So Zakaria's reed was the last one to sink. So what he did was he built a special room for her, in in the temple, in the mosque. Well, yeah, well, it wasn't a mosque then; it was a temple. And um, no one could access this room except him. And he would go every day, so Maryam would be praying and 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 and. and fulfilling this, you know, what, what her mother's uh, promise was and, and, and being a servant to the, to the temple and worshipping Allah. And no one would have access to her except um, Zakaria, the Prophet Zakaria. And he would come in and he would give her food. Uh, you know, every day he would give her food. And one day he comes in and there's a nice platter of fruit there. So he's obviously quite perturbed about this because how the hell did this fruit get in here? You know, no one has access to this room. I'm not sure maybe he had a, a pin code or a special access card. But no one else was allowed to go into that room. And she said, well, you know, I have been praying to Allah and Allah has provided this to me. So at that point, Zakaria understood that this is a special person, that this is somebody that has developed a connection or relationship with Allah that um, they're, they're, they're basically on a new level. Now Allah is providing direct for them. Uh, now, now what... What happened was uh, one day while she was praying, it's almost like Allah SWT knew she was ready for her next test. And a, a man came to her, or an angel in the form of a man came to her. And of course she was, was quite frightened. What, what does this man want? And he told her that that Allah is going to give you a baby. So at that point nothing had and said, Allah is going to give you a baby. And of course uh, she was quite perturbed about this. And as time went on, uh, she she was surprised because no man has touched her. How how can she she have a baby? I mean, uh, for all the children, maybe you can ask your parents later about how that happens. But but um but uh, for the rest of us, you know, uh, normally if a man hasn't touched you, it's very hard not to have a baby. 
Um, so that ended up happening to her. And before long, she started feeling that she was getting pregnant. And of course, that is the worst thing to have because if you're a good, you know, it, it's not just that, but she was a good woman. She came from a good family. And she wasn't married, so how could she be pregnant? What would people think? And it was too much for her to bear. Uh, you know, the social pressures of this. So she left, and she went to Nazareth. And I think this is the part where Muslims and Christians split, because uh, I think some Christians believe that Jesus was born in in that area. If I'm, or I might be mistaken, sorry. Maybe, I'll, maybe I'll, I won't be quoting that then. Um, but what happened was she went to Nazareth, and she stayed there for a bit. And she couldn't exactly... Um, handle that anymore either. So she was. She went, said, I'm going to go back to Jerusalem. On her way to Jerusalem, as it would happen, she gave birth. So she went to a tree and she leaned on this tree and the baby came out. And uh, of course she said, you know, I, had, I only wish that I had died before this day. I really wish. This is too much. So what happened was Allah said to her, it's okay. I'm looking after you. Maybe there was a point she was at that tree. He said, shake that tree and dates will come out and you will be sustained. So a bit like an older day version of Centrelink. You know, you just go there, it's all drops down, yeah, and you, you, you live quite quite easily, of course. Uh, and um, now she, she obviously took the dates and the sustenance, went back to the city, and uh, the crowd, of course, uh, sorry, uh, before she went back to the city, she's worried, because everyone's going to look at her, think she's a single mum, you know, that's done something wrong. and. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, the baby Isa, Jesus, oh, did I mention her baby was Jesus, just in case, uh, the, the, the baby speaks to her and says, do not worry. And she says, well, what do you mean, I can't worry? It says, you take a vow of silence, you don't speak, let me do all the talking, basically, well, not obviously paraphrasing there, but said, I will, I, will, I will take care of this. So she goes to the city and the people are like, what the hell, you got a baby, what's going on? And she obviously has taken a vow of silence, so she points to the baby, and the baby says, I, and this is uh, narrated in the Qur'an, that basically says, I am Allah's servant, Allah has given me the book, and he has made me a prophet. So people understand, look, if the baby's talking and he says he's a prophet, then I guess we can probably say that she's pretty clear. Um, now, at that time, and I think this next part, which I have to condense into five minutes, is probably the most important part of the story. And I think it's a lesson that we can take. Because the most important thing in religion is sincerity. And the problem is, if a person develops a love of material wealth, then religion and sincerity usually get put on the side. Or they get mixed up. Religion gets mixed up with a love of material wealth, and that creates problems. So obviously, at the time then, there were Jewish priests. That was the religion of Musa, who preceded Isa. And they were doing their thing, but of course, corruption had entered. So they were making money off their religion in the sense that if people came to the temple, they would have to pay money to go inside or, or, or to, to pray, and they were living off this. They'd also had uh, they'd also changed some of the rules around a little bit. Now the Musa had stipulated that on the Saturday, on the Sabbath, they were not to do work; they were to devote that day to worship of Allah. But of course, as you do with any <laughs> religious teaching, you take it and people start debating it a little bit more, and then it gets very deep. And this is even something that has continued to, to some Jewish communities today, where on the Friday, on Saturday they'll debate, can you use a mobile phone, can you switch off a light? In Melbourne we had an incident that uh, all these the Jewish people were jaywalking because they weren't allowed to press the button to cross the light, so the, they had, the council had to install the sensor. So these debates were even happening in this time, where they were starting to uh, debate how, uh, what, what, what did Musa mean? And they had lost the spirit. Musa wasn't g getting tied down with the nitty gritty of what you can do and what you can't do. It was basically a day, don't work on this day and worship Allah. But they were starting to get very specific about what you could and could not do. As Isa grew older, so did his sign of his prophethood. And he would go and uh, he would, for example, uh, part of those days you weren't allowed to light a fire. But it would be the middle of winter and there would be old people. So he would light a fire for them. Or, uh, you know, you weren't, um, you know, he would grab fruit from the tree. Because he understood what Musa meant by this prohibition of the Saturday, of the Sabbath. So he would do things that were against that. Uh, but, you know, not against the teaching of Musa, but against what the rabbis and all their extra laws and, 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 and rules that they had made up without any real authority. So they didn't like this. They didn't like the fact that he was doing this, that he was going against their laws. 